Good morning. I know about y'all, this is our first time back. It feels strange and different. Last time I got to do the meditation, I got to wear shorts and just sit there and look funny. Uh, this morning, I wanted to share something. and um, We've all been on this lockdown thing hidden away. Don's been doing the, the men of faith. And I didn't want to take one of his men, so I picked up a woman of faith. And one of the reasons, you might think it's Christmas in July, but I'm going to do Mary, because during all of this, I hope that everybody has learned more and more how to lean on God. Um, you know, my income has gone down more than 70%. Uh, can't say it's affected us a whole lot. You know, it's just that it's gone down. It's not near as much fun, but yeah, you're locked down, you can't go. But anyways, I'm going to read from Luke. Um, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. We live in changing times, so to speak. But here was a virgin who had a vision, and she followed it through. And through all of the the virus and the lockdowns and do this and do that, God is the one who's in control. And Annette and I have talked a lot about it, is listening to God and doing what he's telling us to do. And sometimes it hasn't been easy, especially for me. She keeps telling me that. But at the same time, we both know that God has been totally in control. And as Mary walked out in a time when she could have been stoned and everything else, she walked in the faith of God. And I'm hoping that through all of this, we're learning that same faith. Let's pray. Father, this is your day. And we praise you for it. We praise you for being able to assemble. We praise you for the love that you show down to us. Lord, we don't always understand everything. We don't know your ways because our ways are not your ways. But Lord, we know that you're in control. And for that, we give you praise and just turn this day over to you that you can change hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning and welcome to Fort Caroline Christian Church. If you'll please stand and worship with us. We have the ability to worship and sing praises this morning. The greatest day in history, death is beaten, you have rescued me. Sing it out, Jesus is alive. The empty cross, the empty grave, life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive. He's alive. 
happy day. You washed my sin away. Oh, happy day, happy day. I'll never be the same. Forever I am changed. When I stand in that place, free at last, meeting face to face, I am yours, Jesus, you are mine. Endless joy, perfect peace, earthly pain finally will cease. Celebrate, Jesus is alive. He's alive. And oh, happy day, happy day. You wash my sin away. Oh, happy day, happy day. I'll never be the same. Forever I am changed. time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give. as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. Come. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. Come,
My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When dark seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil my anchor holds within Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. Christ alone. Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found. Dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. He is Lord, Lord of all. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. may be seated. It's great to hear you singing this morning, too. Light of the world, you stepped out into darkness. Open my Mom! 
exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became Lord. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin. Upon that cross, I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say. Again, I'm giving you a familiar passage today. And some of the reasons is, again, the time of meditation and everything else that we've had through being locked down. Um, I'm not a good lockdown person. Thanks. <laughs> I want to share from Luke 22, verse 8. Jesus and, and his disciples prepared the Passover. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat. In verse 14, When the hour had come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, With fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, The cup is the new covenant of my blood, which is shed for you. As we prepare to take these emblems, even our emblems have changed. You know, come in little cups, little caps, kind of neat. Have you ever thought of being in the sandals of Jesus? He's with his 12 apostles that have been with him. He knows them. Don't know how intimately he knows them, but he knows them and he knows their families and, and what they gave up to be with him. He knew what was going to happen. And we know because of the Garden of Gethsemane, he didn't really want to die. I mean, he, he asked God to take the cup from him so that this could pass. But he wanted more than that, what the Father wanted. How many times have we asked for God's help and didn't like the answer? You know, who won out? <laughs> yeah. uh, I've made a wrong decisions a few times. <clears throat> But I also serve the God of second chances, and third, and fourth, and so on, and so on. As you take, remember the why. We're taking of this because it was the last supper of Jesus Christ before he gave his life for us, so that we could have eternal life. 
Let us pray. Father, we do thank you. We thank you that through all of this, we wonder why. We keep asking the questions. We don't know the answers yet. But God, we know that you're in control. And that no matter what happens around us, that if we stay focused on you, that it's going to be for your glory. We just ask for you to be with us. Show us your glory as we go, irregardless of how it comes through. Let us be the ones with the light shining. In Jesus' name. Malachi 3.10, bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessings that will not be room enough to receive it. As I said, my income went down by 70%. My birthday was the beginning of June. It started in April. Um, My wife wants everybody to know. <laughs> Anyways, um, you know, certain things that, hey, the income's different, so you don't do it. And Annette says, well, I'll get it for your birthday. And then something else for my birthday. So I'm publicly telling you that my wife has been really good to me. <laughs> and she wanted everyone to know, so she can shake her head, but she wanted everyone to know. But more so, God has blessed us. He's, I mean, I'd really like to know how and why I deserve it. 
or we deserve it, but we have been greatly blessed. Um, the missions that we support, we're supporting. The ties to the church, we're tithing. Um, the life we live hasn't changed that much other than my wife is cooking again. But through it all, it, it's just, you know, it, I go out and, and go do my job, whatever you want to call it. And I'll sit there and cry in my car because of what God has done and how he's provided. It has just been an emotional high for me the whole time. On my birthday, I had to wear a heart monitor because I went to the doctor with a, I went to the doctor for another problem, but they decided I had a heart problem. And I said, that's the only organ I got that works. You know, and I said, you just want to make me feel like an old man. And, you know, I wonder about it. But I never worried about it because I knew God was in control. And when I went back, there's nothing wrong. It was just, you know, we had to get the insurance to do something. But there again, it was a 20-day period waiting for the results. And, you know, as each day goes, you wonder more and more. And it didn't matter what the outcome was because God has taken care of us. And the outcome was in my favor at this moment, I think. You know, because you're not sure during this time. But it's the giving to the Lord has taught us that we can't outgive him. Let us pray. Father, again, we do praise you because you supply all of our needs. Lord, you supply most of our wants and our desires. Lord, you give abundantly, and we continue to take. But we ask that you take these offerings, that you bless them. Lord, and you just put them to where they need to be, that your kingdom can just gain the glory from it and the growth from it. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church family, and happy 5th of July. I just wanted to say that. Um, you probably heard happy 4th of July a lot, so I just wanted to make today a little more special than yesterday. Hey, this morning, uh, we are continuing in our series entitled Heroes of Faith, and uh, we've already looked at Abel and Noah, and last week was Abraham, and they're all some great examples of faith, and while they are sinners like all of us, they were examples to us. And that's why their stories are recorded in the Bible, so we could learn from them, learn from their mistakes, learn from their victories, and imitate the faith that they had in God. The book of Hebrews chapter 11 gives us a synopsis of their life and the faith that they had in, in God. Today we're going to focus on Jacob. Now, Jacob is the grandson of Abraham. However, his story is different. It's quite unusual. It's different than the rest of the people that you might read about in Hebrews chapter 11. And, and you'll discover why. But first, let me remind you of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, the definition of faith. Hebrews 11, 1 says that faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. The chapter also tells us without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who diligently seek him. The problem is Jacob didn't quite live up to that definition, at least for most of his life. And yet Jacob's story, or Jacob is mentioned in chapter 11 of Hebrews. So here's the verse in, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 21. This is the entire summary 
of Jacob's life. It says, By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on top of his staff. Now, if that's all we knew about Jacob, we would be confused. How is that a definition? How is that an example of faith? The author of Hebrews leaves out a lot, much of Jacob's life. However, the book of Genesis dedicates, doesn't just dedicate one verse, it dedicates 11 entire chapters to the story of Jacob. In Hebrews, we have the one final act as he's blessing his children, as he's leaning on his staff, and as he's worshiping God. We have a lot more we can learn from Genesis, so we're going to focus there. This morning, I will try to summarize the story of Jacob's life, yes, all 11 chapters in the next 20 minutes. So if I tend to be talking a little bit fast, now you'll understand. Hopefully, we can make the connection between the story that we find in Genesis and why the author of Hebrews just mentions that ultimate part, that last part, his final days when he blessed his his grandchildren and he worshiped God. Jacob's story actually begins in Genesis 25, where we're told that his parents, Isaac and Rebekah, are expecting. Hey, they're expecting twins, actually. And the babies were jostling within her womb, as if they were wrestling and causing her a lot of discomfort. So she turns to God, and she asks God, what's going on? Why is my pregnancy like this? And the Lord tells her, that she's going to have two boys. And these boys are the start of two entire nations that will be at odds with each other. And it started already. God also let her know that the firstborn will end up being the servant of the secondborn. So the first one, time of her pregnancy is completed. She's ready to give birth. The firstborn um, is covered with hair. I mean, he just comes out covered with hair. And he's red. Now, I don't know if that refers to the color of his hair or his skin, but he's hairy and he's red. They give him the name Esau. Esau means hairy. And Esau becomes the father of the Edomites. The Edomites, that word Edom means red. And so we kind of kind of get the idea that maybe the Edomites were all red-headed people or very hairy people or had really reddish skin. We don't really know. The second child comes out holding on to Esau's heel. You know that caused mom a lot of pain. That child was born. So they named him Jacob, which has a double meaning. Jacob means he grasped the heel. But it also has a second meaning, which means he deceives. And so the story of Jacob begins. Well, the boys grow up. Esau, the older of the two, becomes a skilled hunter. Jacob is described as a quiet man who enjoys staying at home, tending to his father's flock of sheep. Esau is the favorite of his dad, Isaac, while Jacob is Rebekah's favorite. One day, Esau returns from hunting, and he's starving, at least he thinks he is, and Jacob has been cooking some stew. Esau asks for some of it. Jacob agrees to share the stew, but only if Esau will give up his birthright as being the older son. Esau readily agrees, stating that firstborn has real no advantage if you're dead. So he agrees to trade his birthright for a bowl of stew. The Bible says that Esau despised his birthright. Now that has a whole different meaning, that he would despise being the firstborn son of Isaac. We need to understand the significance of the birthright of the eldest son in the Old Testament in order to fully grasp what that was really meant to Esau or didn't mean to Esau. So the eldest son inherited the leadership of the family whenever the father passed away. All other siblings would now be under the eldest brother's rule, if you will. His leadership, his guidance, his control, his direction. The firstborn also served as the family priest, sometimes as a prophet, 
Uh, sometimes as the king, once the father has passed away. And you see, Esau didn't care anything about that. I don't want to rule over my family. I don't want to serve as a priest. I don't want to serve as a po possible prophet. And I don't want to be a king. I want to go hunting. That's what I'd like to do. He did not value the unique covenant that God had made with his grandfather Abraham and with his father Isaac. Esau, it appears, had no use for God in his life. He also did not believe that God would fulfill the promise made to his family. Esau was not a man of faith. Now we could jump to the conclusion and say, well, it's just a contrast here. Esau obviously didn't believe in God, wasn't a man of faith, wasn't a man that cared for the covenant that God had made with his ancestors, and therefore Jacob did. But we'd be wrong, in my opinion. Because Jacob, for most of his life, was not a man of faith. Now, I'm sure that Rebecca, who loved Jacob the most, that was her favorite son, told Jacob that, now God told me, when you were being born, God told me you were one of two nations and that your older brother would serve you and made him feel special and made him feel like he was special even to God. I'm confident that Rachel, I'm sorry, Rebecca, instilled God's faith or tried to in Jacob's life. The struggle that began in the womb continued as adults. Jacob's grasping of Esau's heel at birth continued as grown men. Jacob took advantage of Esau's hunger on that day, and he traded a bowl of stew for the rights and privilege of being the firstborn. Now, if we skip a few chapters and several decades of age, we find Jacob's dad, Isaac, is now an old man. He's going blind. He knows his days are numbered. He wants to give his eldest son, Esau, the blessing. This is not just a blessing like, may you live long and prosper. This is an official transfer of responsibility of the covenant relationship with God. It's an equivalent of a modern-day last will and testament. But instead of physical inheritance or financial blessings, these blessings are of a spiritual nature. You will be the one who inherits the covenant that God made with your grandfather, Abraham, and with me, Isaac would, would say. And so Isaac asked his favorite and oldest son, Esau, would you go hunting one more time before I die? Prepare that venison meal that I love so much. Why do I think of Frank right now? Prepare that favorite dish for me, and then I will give you the blessing. It was the last meal that he was going, in his mind, last meal he was going to have before he died. And so Esau's all too happy. He goes out hunting, looking for that deer, kills the deer, brings it back to the father. However, it wasn't just that quick. You see, while he's gone out hunting, Rebecca informs Jacob about what's about to happen. That Esau is about to receive his father's blessing. And so she conspires with Jacob. Let's cover your arms and neck with goat skin so that you'll feel hairy like your brother and you'll kind of smell like the field. And that way when you come in to your father, he'll think you're Esau. And in fact, Esau is going out to hunting to prepare a dish for your father to eat. So I'll cook up some meal for him and you take it to him. You give him the meal, cover your skin with this goat skin, and you will pretend to be Esau. So Jacob brings the food into Isaac's tent, pretending to be Esau, his brother. He tells his father that God has given me success today. It made me very quick in finding a deer and killing it and preparing it and cooking it. And Isaac, who is nearly blind, is just a little suspicious he wants to touch his son. Come near where I can touch you. So Isaac reaches out his hand, 
feels Jacob's arm and neck. He feels the goat skin, but he still has doubts in his mind. He asks, are you really Esau? Because the voice sounds like Jacob. You can just picture in in the story there that Jacob can go, (coughs) yeah, it's me, Dad. It's uh, Esau. And he did lies. He lies to his father on his father's deathbed. The trick works. Jacob has now deceived not only his brother out of getting the birthright, but now he's deceived his father and received the spiritual blessing of God. Here are the words that Isaac speaks over Jacob. As he puts his hands on his son, thinking it's Esau, but it's really Jacob, Isaac says, May nations serve you, and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers, and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed, and those who bless you be blessed. It doesn't take long before Esau discovers that Jacob has deceived his father. He's stolen the blessing. Having already taken the birthright years ago, and now the blessing, Esau is furious, and he vows, as soon as my dad dies and we have the burial, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill my brother. I hate him. So Rebecca sends Jacob away, telling him, flee, get out of town, get out of Dodge, head to my family's side who live in Haran, and stay with them until your brother's anger subsides. So Jacob sets off on this 550-mile trip on foot from Canaan to Haran. Now, this journey will take over a month. And you know that first day as he's leaving, he's he's constantly looking over his shoulder and just wondering. He's scared. He's alone. He's afraid. He's afraid that Esau is pursuing him to kill him. He knows his brother is a great hunter. The sun is finally going down on this day. He's been walking all day. He's, He's hot. He's tired. And he's hungry. He lays down on the ground to sleep, and he literally pulls up a rock to be a pillow under his head. I want to read the story together. This is Genesis chapter 28, if you have your Bibles or your app. Genesis chapter 28, and we'll be reading verses 10 through 22. This is what God's Word says. So Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. And when he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and he lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. You will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the people on the earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until... I lost my place. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey, 
I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house. Then the Lord will be my God and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give, give me, I will give you a tenth. Now, Jacob had a dream. And it's not a dream about Esau killing him. That would be what I would think. If I was going to have a dream, that would have been my dream, that my brother was about standing over me, about to kill me. But it's not that dream. It's not a dream about him being lord over his brothers and his brothers bowing down to him. It's not a dream about being faithful to God's covenant made to his grandfather and his father. It's a weird dream. The dream consists of a stairway that's reaching up to heaven. Angels of God are descending and ascending on this stairway. And at the top of the stairs in heaven is, is God. The God of Abraham and Isaac is now speaking to Jacob directly. I also find it interesting that God did not reprimand Jacob. He didn't reprimand him saying, Jacob, 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 why did you trick your brother Esau out of his birthright? He didn't scold him about deceiving his father or condemn him for flat out lying to his dad. Oh, it's, it's me, it's me, Esau. Or even shame him for stealing that blessing. Instead, God is gracious over and over and over. Despite Jacob's unfaithfulness to his brother and his dad, God promises to bless Jacob. God will give Jacob and his descendants the land that, on where he is sleeping. God promised Jacob's descendants will be like the dust of the earth. God promised that he would go with Jacob and, and watch over him wherever he may travel and bring him safely back. So Jacob wakes up from this dream, and the first words... Out of his mouth, this place is awesome. God is in this place. Now, it must have been still in the middle of the night because it says then when the sun came up, Jacob took the stone that he was using as a pillow and turned it into a pillar. Now, if you're from the south or you're born in Kentucky like me, saying those two words in the same sentence is quite a struggle. And you should have you know, given me a round of applause there to say that took the pillow and turned it into a pillar. Um, that's difficult. The rock is now a pillar. It's an altar for worshiping God. It will only serve, it will serve as a memorial, not only for Jacob, but for his children and his grandchildren and generations to come. They will know this is the place that God spoke to Jacob and transferred that covenant relationship that he had made with Abraham and Isaac and now belongs to Jacob. It means the house of God. So Jacob makes a vow. He makes a vow to God based on this dream and what he heard God saying. But again, note, Jacob does not say, since God has promised. He doesn't say, because God has said. Instead, he uses that two-letter word, if. If God will, if God will be with me and watch over me on this journey I'm taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear. That wasn't in the original thing that God said, but he added to God's word. If God will do this so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that I give, you give me, I will give you a tenth. If. Jacob is living by a let's wait and see kind of operation. He wants to have all the benefits from God first before he's willing to commit. Jacob is non-committal at this point in the relationship. He's saying, if God proves himself to be faithful, then I'll make God my God. If God does all that he's promised, and throw in some clothes and food as well, then I will give God a tenth of what he gives me. Everything's backwards here. Jacob is treating God as a passenger 
in the car instead of putting him in the driver's seat. Jacob is trying to negotiate with God. Now, if you'll do that, then I'll do this. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Starting in the womb and continuing through his life up to this point, Jacob has been wrestling. He's been wrestling with his brothers to gain the upper hand. He's now doing the same thing with God. He's bartering with God for his own benefit. Now, imagine what it would have been like if back when you were dating your spouse, if he or she had said to you, I love you. I want to be your husband, wife. I want to be your spouse. I want to raise a family with you. I want to go, grow old with you. I want to be your best friend all the days of our life until the day we die. And your response is, well, let me see. Okay, if you will love me, and if you will give me a family, and if you will be my best friend, and if you provide for all my needs and my clothes and my food, by the way, then I'll let you marry me. I don't think that would go over very well. That's what Jacob was doing with God. But our God's a gracious God. He's a patient God. I wonder if God rolled his eyes at Jacob. Oh, my goodness. When are you going to grow up? For God did watch over Jacob, and then he did bring him back to the land of his father and grandfather. And God did bless him and his descendants with, to become a nation of people too numerous to count. You would think that this encounter with God would transform your life. But Jacob doesn't transform his way of living and conniving and scheming for a long time. In fact, he finally reaches Haran. He marries into a family, and they do the same thing back to him. Laban, his father-in-law, deceives Jacob right off the bat. You know, if you work for me for seven years, I'll give you the girl that you love. Well, he loved Rachel. It turned out that on his wedding day, he married Leah. And when he discovers it, he's furious, of course. And Laban explains, well, the oldest daughter has to be married first. But if you work another seven years, I'll give you my daughter, Rachel. And so he does. And, but then he owns nothing, so he has to work six more years in order to get sheep, goats, and such. I divert from the story. After 20 years, Jacob makes his way back to Canaan. Just before Jacob meets his brother Esau, he isolates his family from himself for their protection because he assumes that Esau is still angry and is out to kill him. And so he takes his wife and his children and his servants and all his animals, everything he owns, he puts them on the other side of the river and he's by himself waiting to meet Esau. And that night, God shows up. Let's read that part of the story. In Genesis chapter 32, and we'll start with verse 22 and read through 28. Just six verses here. So that night Jacob got up and took his two wives and his two maidservants and his 11 sons. And he crossed the ford of the Jabbok River. After he had sent them across the stream, he, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. And then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. And remember the name, Jacob, the one who grasped, the one who deceives and then this man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. God meets Jacob face to face. Now, some Bible scholars think that it was an angel that sent by God and Jacob wrestled with an angel. Others think that possibly this is Jesus pre-incarnate. And he just appeared in physical form and wrestled with Jacob. Either way, Jacob doesn't know who this is. He thinks he's alone, and suddenly he's wrestling with someone. 
And he has a wrestling match with God that continues the rest of the evening and into the morning when the sun's coming up. And Jacob's not winning. But he refuses to let go. He's stubborn. He insists on receiving a blessing before giving up. Similar to his birth where he held on to his brother's heel, Jacob is holding on to this stranger and he will not admit defeat in wrestling with God. So God touches the hip joint and dislocates Jacob's hip. Still, still, Jacob holds on. He wrestles. And it's at this point that God reveals who has been wrestling with Jacob. The wrestling comes to an end. Jacob realizes he's been wrestling with God face to face. And God changed Jacob's name to Israel. Now, the name Israel means he who struggles with God. It's a turning point for Jacob. For all his life, he's been wrestling with both people and now with God. And really, he's been wrestling with God all along. He just wasn't conscious of it. Jacob has not lived a consistent life of faith in God. He's lived a life in faith in himself, in his own clever ways, ways of scheming and cheating and trying to get ahead for himself. He has known God. He might say he's even had a relationship with God, but God was a means to an end for Jacob. What can you do for me? He'd missed out so much trying to do things his own way. If he had just surrendered to God and earnestly, earnestly sought God, what would his reward have been? Jacob had lived in fear of his brother. He lived in shame of deceiving his father. He lived in animosity with his father-in-law. He lived in tension with his two wives plus two other handmaids. And above all, he struggled and he wrestled with God for refusing to surrender completely. But this time, now he's ready to surrender. We can fast forward now. We can fast forward several more years and find Jacob at the end of his life. Just like the author of Hebrews has said, he is living in Egypt. His son Joseph is second in command of the world's superpower at that time. Jacob is now a man of deep faith in God because he's experienced what God has done in his life. He's experienced the mercy and the grace that he didn't deserve. He knows that God is in control and not him. So he brings his two children, his two grandchildren of Joseph, the two, the two children of Joseph, his two grandchildren. He brings them close to say goodbye and to give them a blessing. And this is the part of Jacob's life that the author of Hebrews highlights as the man of faith. By faith, Jacob blesses Joseph's two sons and worships God while leaning on his staff. Now, from, again, from reading Hebrews, you wouldn't understand, what? That doesn't make sense. Why is that an example of faith? Only if you know the entire story and what it took for him to get there. Jacob goes on to tell his sons and his grandsons about the God of Abraham, my grandfather, the God of Isaac, my father, and my God. And he wants to be your God too. Not just a name, but personally knowing. Jacob has finally stopped wrestling with God. He surrendered his life and his family to God. He has sincere faith in God. His last request, before I die or when I die, promise me you won't bury me in Egypt. I know that land in Canaan is the promised land. So take my body all the way back there and bury me in Canaan land. He wants to be a part of the future blessings and promises that God is going to give his descendants. You may wonder, gosh, what's the point of this sermon? What's the point of this whole story? There's only one main point, and this is it right here. 
Stop wrestling with God for control. Stop it. I'm preaching to myself as well. It's a common thing for most people. We tend to believe in God, but we wrestle with God for complete control. We want God to be a part of our life, but ultimately I want to be Lord of my own life. We're wrestling with God when we do that. We need to just stop wrestling with God. Stop struggling. Surrender. Repent. Allow God to have full control of your life. He's gracious to us. God is so gracious. You know, you're like me. You struggle. You say you're going to do this, and you end up wrestling against God again and again and again and again. He's a gracious God. He's a forgiving God. You know, this weekend, America celebrated another year of independence. We have a freedom that most of the world, most of the other world can only dream about the type of freedom we have. But civil freedom, civil liberty without God is useless. It only leads to a life full of strife and division and sin. Let's not be independent from God. We're thinking about our independence in America. Let's not be independent from God. Let's be dependent on Him. In fact, let's be enslaved to Him. Let's be Him be Lord. Let Him be in control. Will you pray with me? Well, this morning... We admit we, um, we're no better off than Jacob. We struggle with our faith and we struggle to do things the way we want them done. And um, we wrestle with you probably on a daily basis. And yet you're there, you're gracious, forgiving, and you carry out your part. The promise of salvation, the promise of the Holy Spirit, the promises of forgiveness. You're faithful. We're the ones who are not faithful. So, Father, this morning, don't dislocate our our hip, please, but do dislocate our pride. Touch our heart. Help us to see clearly that it's you that we struggle with. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing an invitation hymn, as always. And we you stand, and if, if God's touching your heart this morning, you want the elders to pray with you. If you have a decision you would like to make, surrendering your life to Christ or joining this body of Christ, then we invite you to come as we sing.
Hey, we have had uh, several um, prayer requests uh, been turned into the office this week, and they've been sent out to via email, let you know. Uh, a lot of our brothers and sisters are hurting, and they uh, know of others that are hurting. So please take a look at that and uh, spend some time with God this week. Wrestle on their behalf with God. Let's pray as we're dismissed. Um, Father God, we, we ask that uh, you would continue to bless us, even though, honestly, we're, we're really not worthy of receiving any more blessings, that you're a good God. And so, Father, we ask that these blessings would not just be for us, that through the, the blessings you provide to us, we would be able to show Christ to a world that's hurting and searching and that we would be able to point them to you. So, Father, help us to be the church as we leave this building this morning. We love you. We thank you for your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. As you leave, would you please grab the communion cups and put them in the trash can by the doors? And then if you want to stop and talk, would you do that like out on the front porch so that we don't block the foyer. And we'll see you. The greatest day in history Death is beaten, you have rescued me Sing it out, Jesus is alive The empty cross, the empty grave Life eternal, you have won the day Shout it out, Jesus is alive He's alive And oh, happy day Happy day, you wash my sin away. Oh, happy day, happy day, I'll never be the same. Forever I am changed. When I stand in that place, face I am yours Jesus you are mine endless joy perfect peace earthly pain finally we'll see celebrate Jesus is alive he's alive and oh happy day happy day you wash my sin away oh happy day happy day i'll never be the same forever i am changed